With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. On April the 6th, 1909, Admiral Robert Perry was credited with, be, with being the first person to lead an expeditionary force to the North Pole. And one of the most fascinating stories from his journey comes from his admiral's log during the final weeks of that expedition. They got up one morning, and as they would do their navigation, they did dead reckoning by the morning stars. And they drove those dog sleds, I mean mush, 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 as hard and passionately north as they could possibly go. They broke camp for the night, got up the next morning to do their readings, only to discover they were further south than when they had started the next day. He thought he must have miscalculated, but once again, all day long, driving that dog sled north as hard as they could go. They camped that night, got up the next morning, did their readings again, and once again, they were further south than when they had started the day before. It was then that Admiral Perry, no, no novice to the ice of the North Pole, discovered that they were traveling atop a large ice flow. Think about a huge glacier, for example. It was so large they could not tell, they could not sense that it was moving south faster than they were heading north. Added to the fact that they would break camp and spend the night the whole time moving further and further south. I find that that historical illustration is a picture of what can happen in the lives of many believers, including on many occasions today's preacher. We can so easily get trapped on the ice flow of sin and find ourselves drifting out into the world faster than our supposed commitment to Christ can bring us closer to the Lord. This seems to be what is on the heart and mind of the inspired writer to the Hebrews. Some scholars say that this is written to lost people about the danger of rejecting the gospel. But from my study, I believe that this is a warning written to those who are at the very least professing believers. He uses first-person pronouns and talks about what we have believed and what we have heard and the danger that we face if we neglect so great a salvation. It seems to this pastor today that the warning is about the wayward believer. And with that in mind, I want to just show you three things from these four verses. First, consider with me there is a command. The command is nestled in verse 1. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention. He will go on to warn about the results of neglecting salvation. You need to see from the beginning that this drifting is not a result of ignorance. It's a result of negligence. It's not a matter of not knowing. It's a matter of not doing. The recipient of this letter, each of them, they had heard, they had seen, and they had at least on the surface, if not genuinely and sincerely, they had embraced that message. But under intense first century persecution, they are tempted and enticed to turn away from the simplicity of the gospel and for many of them to go back to the dead religion of Judaism. Now you must understand that because Judaism was among other things a religion of works. These people were very, very busy in their supposed service to God, but they were just not busy about the most important things. If you are in a boat on the river and you want to stay in one place, and you're so busy fishing that you're paying no attention to your anchor, you're so busy casting the net that you're paying no attention to the fact your rope has become untied from the dock. You can be busy doing a lot of stuff, but not busying yourself with the things that matter the most. Could it be that like Admiral Perry's team, there are some among us today Busily driving your dog sled, mush, 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 toward Sunday school. But you are embracing immorality and sin. And that sin is pulling you away from God faster than your supposed service to Sunday school can draw you to the Lord. 
In his commentary of the text, Richard Phillips writes that these Hebrew Christians were being persecuted by the Jewish community around them and the And the writer urgently warns them not to renounce Jesus Christ under pressure. Much like a lighthouse on the shore, the writer says, you've got to command. Pay much closer attention. Like a smoke detector sounding the alarm in the night. Wake up from your slumber and pay much closer attention. Like a flashing caution light on the shoulder of the road as you go around a dangerous curve. The Spirit of God is moving through this text to say, sit up and pay attention. And don't just pay attention. Pay much closer attention. There is danger ahead. And the danger is that you may drift away from a close fellowship with the Lord. Now, if we are to do that, there are three things that we find nestled in this command. Number one, we must revere the Son. Chapter 2 verse 1 begins, for this reason. That's just a fancier way of saying therefore, and it connects us to what he has been saying about Jesus Christ back in chapter 1. If you've been visiting and worshiping with us for these several weeks, you know that chapter 1 just introduces us to the grand theme of this book, that Jesus Christ is totally God. He is unquestionably supreme. He's legally enthroned. He's incredibly powerful. He is permanently reigning. Jesus Christ is worthy of our ultimate reverence. He's triumphant, unrivaled, lofty, invincible, and preeminently seated on the throne of heaven. And the point here with this little phrase, for this reason we must pay much closer attention, he says when you think about who Jesus is and what Christ has done, listen now, not just in the abstract, but what he's done for you. Bore your penalty on the sin as we have so powerfully sang of this morning. Took my place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been, not just to the world. Oh, how good you've always been to me. He says, in light of who Christ is and what Christ has done, listen to what he says. Some of you are old enough to remember the old E.F. Hutton commercials. The investment broker. The tagline of that commercial said, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people, listen, well, do you know Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice and they listen and they follow me? Now, if I tell you something, you can take it or leave it. Now, that doesn't include my kids. I'm, I'm talking to the rest of you. If your last name is not Stone, if I, tell you, if I tell you to do something in and of myself, you can take it or leave it. But if Jesus tells you to do something, you better write it down, take it to the bank, and obey it. To these Hebrews who were tempted to turn their back on the Lord, to become like the defective disciples that Brother Jared so powerfully taught us about last Sunday evening from John chapter 6, the writer says, you need to listen to Jesus because there's nobody like the Lord. Nobody's ever done for you what Jesus has done for you. The Son of God, the creator of the world, the ruler of angels, the perfect sacrifice for our sin. Listen to him because nobody is like him in his person or in his work. While I'm in this neighborhood, could I pull over and park for just a moment? When you begin to drift away from the Lord, you are giving your allegiance to lesser people and to lesser things. People who've never done for you what Christ has done for you. That guy that you met this weekend when you were out clubbing, he's never done for you what Jesus Christ has done for you. That that quarterback or that running back for your favorite college football team, you're going to forsake the assembly of God's people this fall to go watch a guy play football who'll never even know your name. You don't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. And some of you will forsake the things of God trying to hang a Boone and Crockett buck on the wall in just a few weeks. And when you die, your grandkids are going to sell that mount to the Cracker Barrel. And the writer says, for this reason, when you think about the Lord and what He's done for you, you ought to give Him your undivided, undistracted, undiluted allegiance and attention. Pay much closer attention. Revere the Son. Verse 1 also admonishes us to receive the Scripture. 
Do you see it again? For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Now, that word heard or hear gives us our word for acoustics. It speaks of literal, actual sound. It's not just something that you've read. That's wonderful if you're reading the Word of God. But this is something that we have heard. It has been proclaimed in public declaration. In other words, it references what you've heard in a public gathering of the people of God. This connects us back to what he said at the beginning of chapter 1, that God in times past spoke through the prophets in all these different ways and methods and manners, signs and wonders. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son. The implication here is, if you understand who he is, what he has done, and how he has spoken, and that he is now speaking to us through the proclamation of his word, we should seek to honor and receive the word of God. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That same psalmist said, How can a young man cleanse his way? By keeping it according to your word. Verse 11 of that chapter, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. How are we going to avoid drifting into a wayward life of sin? You tether your life to the word of God. Have you ever been in a service and thought, well, I didn't really get much out of that? It's all right to be honest in church. I know if you're nodding, you're talking about a time that a staff member was preaching, not any time that I've preached. No, I've preached some duds before. You you, you who preach and teach in this room, you'll understand one Wednesday night, uh, when my office was over in this part of the building, I got down on all fours after the service, and Brother Richard Golden uh, came in here, and he said, Pastor, you looking for something? I'll help you look for it. I was crawling on all fours right down here. I said, yeah, I'm looking for a red-hot sermon because I was in my office just on the other side of this wall, and it was hot as a firecracker, but I dropped it somewhere on the way to the pulpit. (laughs) But have you ever been in a service? Maybe a Sunday school class, and you just kind of think, you may not even be mad about it, but you think... My teacher didn't have it today. She wasn't on today. Preacher didn't have it. I I, I don't think I got much out of that. Listen, friend, you got more out of it than anything you could have ever imagined. You got something out of it even when you think you did not. I'm reminded of the story of a churchgoer who wrote a letter to the editor of a newspaper complaining that He didn't get anything out of the messages when he went to church. He said, he wrote, I've gone for 30 years now, and in that time I've heard something like 3,000 sermons. But for the life of me, I can't remember a single one of them. I think I'm wasting my time, and preachers are wasting their time with all those sermons. And that started no small controversy with letters to the editor back and forth about the issue of faithful church attendance. It went on for several weeks until finally somebody wrote a letter that was the death nail to the debate. That writer said, I've been married for 30 years now. In that time, my wife has cooked over 32,000 meals. But for the life of me, I can't recall the entire menu for a single one of those meals. But I do know this, they each nourished me and gave me strength, the strength I needed to do my work. If my wife had not given me these meals, I would be physically dead today. Likewise, if I had not gone to church for nourishment, I would be spiritually dead today. Well, once you've been given spiritual life, you're never in danger of being spiritually dead, but you can become a spiritual drifter if you don't revere the Son, receive the Scripture. Thirdly, we're talking about the command, you need to realize the seriousness For the Bible says in verse 1, for this reason we must pay much closer attention. The King James says we must give earnest heed. The New American Standard brings out the connotation of this emphasis and says we must pay much closer attention. The word here means to grasp, to hold on to, to attach yourself, to cling to it. It's describing a person who latches on to the Word of God, who who grabs hold of the Scripture and attaches themselves to it as though for dear life. 
Like a drowning man in the ocean who's been thrown a life preserver. Knowing the seriousness of letting go. Here is a man or a woman of God. A teenager that's following Christ. Maybe an eight or a nine year old little boy or little girl. Who's got enough sense to know that the natural tendency of my life is not to drift closer to Christ. But to to, to drift away from the Lord. I think his name was Robert Robinson who wrote the wonderful hymn, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. It's one of my favorite hymns because it's my testimony, especially that line, prone to wonder. Oh, Lord, I feel it. Does anybody else feel it? Prone to leave the God I love. And if you realize the seriousness of that, you will pray as we sing, Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Charles Spurgeon comments on this truth and writes, It is a wonder that we should have the message of the glorious gospel in our possession and be so little stirred about it. Upon our eyes there seems to have fallen a strange dimness and upon our ears a strange dullness. This is why the wise Christian seeks to pay attention even in the more boring sermons because you recognize what's at stake. And yet, whenever the gospel is preached, if there's a crowd of any size, there are some sitting, as it were, on the edge of their seats. Their heart is as open as is their Bible. And there are others... Returning messages on their Apple Watch. Scrolling through Facebook. Checking the weather to see what you pl- will, it, will, it, will it jive with your plans for the afternoon. To that, there's a word of warning not only here in Hebrews, but also in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, the Bible tells us we need to give attention, we need to hear and to heed the Word of God. But James says it's possible to hear it with the ears on the side of your head, but not hear it with the ears of the Spirit. Now, you parents ought to know what I'm talking about. You you give your children some instructions, and you can tell they're not paying you any more attention than the man in the moon. You say, Daughter, what did I just tell you? Son, what did I just tell you? And they can repeat to you word for word what you said. But their disobedience and inaction proves it went in one ear and out the other. And if we're going to avoid drifting, there's a commandment that we've got to keep. We've got to receive the Word of God. This past week, I... Traveled up to Kentucky. I preached at a men's conference on Friday night. Did a revival Sunday through Wednesday. And because of my travel, I had two connecting flights going and two flights on the way back. That means in the last week and a half, I've heard the same little message four different times. I've heard it scores of times in my life because of traveling. You, you know, when you get on a plane, the flight attendant asks for your attention. And they tell you to be sure to cinch up that seat belt. And then they say something like this, in the unlikely event that we lose cabin pressure, an oxygen mask will drop from the compartment above you. If you're traveling with the elderly, the infant, or someone who is disabled, please put on your mask first before you try to assist them. The oxygen is flowing even if the bag does not inflate. In the unlikely event of a landing in water, by the way, when a plane lands in water, that's called a crash. In the unlikely event of a landing in water, your seat cushion will become a flotation device. And I'm sitting there on the plane looking around. Almost nobody is listening to the flight attendant. You know why? Two reasons. They've heard it before, and they don't appreciate the danger. They've heard it so that they could recite it in a sermon like I just did. We know it backwards and forward. And we instinctively think that warning is for some other passenger in some other seat on some other flight, but it doesn't apply to me. 
Did you know the same thing happens spiritually when the preacher preaches about drifting away from the Lord? There are some of you that say, I've heard that before. I know that message. I, I've taught that message. I've shared that message. I know what you're going to say, Brother Mike, that God gave commandments in the Word. Some things to do and some things to not do. And if we disobey them, we're going to face consequences and discipline in our life. is not going to be pleasing to the Lord and it's ultimately not going to be pleasing to us. We're going to stand before the Lord in judgment so we ought to do what's right. I get it. I've heard it before. And you tuned out. And then there are those who say, I've heard it, I agree with it, and I sure hope that somewhere somebody's listening because it probably applies to them. But there's no danger here in my seat. And the writer of Hebrews says, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we... and that, in this case, we means you. And we means me. So that we do not drift away from it. There's a command. But now at the end of verse 1, there's a caution. What is the caution here? So that we do not drift away from it. That word is also rightly translated as the word slip. That we don't slip away from it. That we don't drift away from it. A pastor that I know preached on this text and he called, he titled his message as a question, is your slip showing? Slipping, just drifting away. This is actually the only place that word appears in all of the New Testament. It describes a boat drifting downstream or out to sea. It was also used to describe a a container made of animal skin or a boat made of wood that had become dry and cracked. And because of the cracks, the contents are lost. It came to describe the passing of an opportunity. The idea is during uh, travel that was often by boat, someone that got distracted missed their port. And they wake up after the boat is all the way, way downstream, and there's an opportunity that is gone. The caution here, this word, means to lose or to perish. Something that's gone forever. It's that, that boat drifting out to sea that is lost. The boat that is dry and cracked, and the contents have perished forever at the bottom of the ocean, or an opportunity that is gone, forever lost, and never to return. One caution here is about drifting. There's another caution about dryness. And there's a caution here about distraction. Are you a dry Christian today? Have you gotten distracted by the things of the world? If so, there's a caution for you about drifting away from the Lord. Now, I just want to wrap this caution up with three simple admonitions. Number one, you need to examine where you are leaning. Again, the admonishment here is against drifting away from the Lord. This word was used to describe a boat that was not properly anchored in the harbor or not properly tied to the dock. And the drifting, listen to me now, it occurred gradually. So gradually, the people on the boat barely even noticed. In fact, if you ever seek to correct, confront, or rebuke someone who's drifting away from the Lord, they may turn around and rebuke you in return and point out to you that they've changed almost nothing in their life. They still come to church. They still come to Sunday school. They're still here on Sunday night. They even come on Wednesday night. I'm not drifting away from the Lord and if you think I am, you're a narrow-minded, backward, legalistic, fundamentalist bigot. Quit being a professional picker of nits, you nitpicking Christian. I'm not drifting. A friend, in my experience, both personally in my life and what I've seen in the lives of others, backsliding usually occurs very, very gradually. When you see someone crash spiritually, I mean the pastor who's discovered to be in some immorality, the deacon who's left his wife for another woman, 
the choir member who has suddenly discovered in some secret sin what you're seeing. Listen now, what you're seeing in that moment is the manifestation of a spiritual corruption and corrosion that has been happening for some length of time. Just yesterday, I saw a report coming from South Florida. You remember um, maybe a month or so ago, several weeks ago, there was the crash of that condominium building. A, A portion of the building just suddenly collapsed. And the report came in this week, some of the initial studies. It didn't surprise me at all. They, they were beginning to uncover years of corrosion in the stuff that was to hold that building together. What's true of that building is true in my life and your life. If you don't give attention to the daily details, all of a sudden there will be a great crash and the crash may have happened all at one time but the factors that led to that crash happened slowly and gradually almost imperceptibly slow I was speaking to a man on one occasion years ago who had in my estimation lost everything lost his family lost his career lost his profession and because of that began losing his physical possessions i think he had more guns at the pawn shop than in his gun cabinet and i asked him one day on the phone how did it happen What happened and how did it happen? He said, I don't know how it happened, preacher. I don't know how it happened. Well, preacher, that's not true. I do know how it happened. It happened slowly. Like Lot just leaning his tent towards Sodom. At that moment when he turns his tent around, he has no intention of going down there. He's just kind of compromising and leaning in that direction. Which way are you leaning this morning? Some years ago when I was having some trees taken down at our house, I wanted a bunch of them taken down until the tree surgeon gave me his quote, and then I started deciding which ones I really still loved. (laughs) Well, one of them was not far from our house. I decided to not take it down because when that oak tree started out, obviously, as a young sapling, it was the acorn had fallen in a hedgerow of huge red tips. And as that little sapling began to search for and find the light, it started growing about maybe 35 or 40 degrees away from my house. And for several feet going up the base of that oak tree, it was leaning about 40 degrees away from my house. And here's what I determined. I don't need to take that tree down right now because when the storm comes, I know which way that tree's going to fall. That's the way it's been growing. That's where all the weight is. That's just... That's where it's leaning. And I've seen that in my own life, and I've seen it in the lives of God's people. When the storms of life come, and storms can come in a lot of different ways. It can come through chaos, through some distress. It can come through just a sudden temptation to disobey the Lord. You will generally fall the way you were previously leaning. Where are you leaning? That's a caution. But this word drift also brings up another point. Not just where are you leaning, but why are you leaking? Remember this word drift or slip described a dry vessel or a dry container. And because of the cracks that would develop, everything on the inside would be lost. I'm talking about dryness. Perhaps you're here today and your spiritual life is as dry as cracker juice. There's no vitality, no life. Obviously, there are emotions and signs of life, signs of religious experience. I mean, you're here on a Sunday morning with all kinds of challenges across our community. You're here. But is there any real spiritual life? I've counseled married couples before, and and, and we have to start with this question. Do Do you want a marriage, or do you just want to stay married? Because if all you want to do is just stay married, the answer is just don't ever go file for divorce. But now if you want a marriage, that there's some life to it, there's some stuff you're going to have to do. 
And so I ask you today, are you satisfied just having a, 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 a legal relationship with Jesus? Or do you, want a, do you want an abundant life of victory and joy and peace? Ephesians 5, 18 tells us to not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but to be filled with the Spirit. That word filled literally means to be continually, constantly, perpetually, always be being filled with the Spirit. You say, why would I need to do that every moment of every day? Why do I need to keep being filled with the Holy Spirit? Because you leak. You drip. I didn't say you are a drip, although you may be, but you drip. You leak. When somebody cuts you off in traffic... You leak. When your kids get on your nerve, I say nerve because it's the last nerve, you leak. When sin comes and temptation comes and waywardness comes, you and I leak. You say, preacher, what would cause such a spiritual leak that would bring about a spiritual Drift. I think there are a lot of reasons. Busyness. Fatigue. Somebody said that fatigue makes cowards of us all. It also tends to make backsliders of each of us. Distraction. Man, if the devil can't distract you with evil, he'll distract you with good stuff. And do we not live in a distracted world? I sat on the couch for a few minutes last night and found myself convicted just thinking through this message that we live in a day where we've always got to have something on. There's always got to be some new app on the phone to, 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 to vie for our time and for our attention. And distraction can lead to spiritual dryness. Pride can lead to dryness. You either think it's not going to happen to me or you're so stinking proud that you will not admit that it has happened to you. Pride has kept more people from kneeling at this altar than wheelchairs and bad knees. And a dry Christian will become a casual Christian and a casual Christian will soon become a casual T. Why are you leaking? where you're leaning. There's a third caution, and that describes what you are losing. You remember I told you that this word came to describe a person that missed the opportunity to get off the boat, and it just means a, a missed opportunity. And most of the time, it was an opportunity, a chance that would not ever return. You got any decisions you'd like to go back and undo? Mistakes you'd like to go back and correct? You have any service you'd like to go back and render? Any gifts you'd like to go back and give? Any offerings you might like to go back and render unto the Lord? Drifting. It has been said that some things, once they're gone, you can never get them back. A word that is spoken, an arrow that is shot, a life that's wasted, cash you've given to your wife, I'm just seeing if you're listening, an opportunity that's missed. I can look back over my own life and ministry as a husband, as a dad, as a preacher, as a soul winner. And I have to say I've wasted many precious years. And today we need to add, Lord, I'm coming home because the only thing more foolish than wasting the opportunities of yesterday would be wasting the opportunities of today and the ones God may grant you tomorrow. There's a command. There's a caution. Thirdly and real quickly, there's a commitment. For see, if we're going to heed this warning and avoid the danger, we've got to do something different. I've already hinted at this, but drifting is the natural tendency of a boat on the river, and it's the natural tendency of the human heart. You've never drifted toward godliness one moment in your life. Hey, you will not follow Jesus on accident. 
You will not follow Jesus on accident. There's something that you and I must do. There's a commitment that we have to make. No boat has ever drifted down, drifted upstream and tied itself to the dock. And no Christian has ever drifted into a closer relationship with Jesus. So what are you going to do? There's a threefold commitment I find in verses 2 and following. First, we need a commitment to simple purity. Just old-fashioned obedience, verse 2. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable. Now let me stop there and just teach you real quickly. Most scholars agree that is a reference to the Ten Commandments and to many of the Levitical laws that flowed out of those commandments. We know God gave Moses the Ten Commandments at the top of Mount Sinai, but in Acts chapter 7 and in the book of Galatians, there's reference to the fact that somehow in a mysterious way known only to God, God used an angel in the process of mediating that word from God to the prophet Moses. We know that it's all Scripture is ultimately given by the inspiration of God. But at least on that occasion, an angel was somehow involved in conveying that message from God to Moses and then from Moses to the people. And even though they were God's chosen people, the word that had been given was unalterable. Could not be changed. No exemptions, no exceptions, no excuses. And this verse says that every act of transgression which is doing something you ought not to do, trespassing, violating, a step in the wrong direction. This verse says that every act of transgression and every act of disobedience received a just penalty. Now, transgression means stepping across the line. This word disobedient actually is a play on words in the Greek of the New Testament. Verse 1 says we must pay much closer attention. This word disobedience means to not pay attention. So God told you to do, not do something and you did it anyway. That's a transgression. God told you to do something and you didn't do it. That's a disobedience because you heard it but you didn't really hear it. You weren't paying attention. And having finished a lesson on the fact that Jesus is higher than the angels, greater than the angels, and above all the angels, the The message here is, if a message that came to man in some way through an angel could not be altered and every transgression and disobedience got a just penalty, how do we think as the people of God that we will escape the chastisement of the Lord? I'm talking about a commitment to simple purity. I'm not going to go down the laundry list Of things you're doing, you know Jesus tells you you ought not be doing. Nor will I create a list this morning of all the stuff that you ought to be doing that you're not. Because the Spirit of God is going to be better at that this morning than I'll be. But if you want to avoid drifting away from the Lord. You need a commitment today to do what you ought and stop doing what you ought not. A commitment to simple purity. Secondly is a commitment to spiritual passion. Verse 3, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Again, there's a comparison and a contrast here. If God's people in the Old Testament did not escape when they neglected to obey the Word of God, how do we think on this side of Calvary that we're going to escape if we neglect So great a salvation. All they had were ten commandments and some reminder of stuff like Abraham raising the knife at the top of Mount Moriah. They had a glimpse and a glimmer. We have the full revelation of the gospel of the cross of Jesus. And if they did not escape the chastisement of God, how do we think we will escape? It's worth noting here that the warning is not for those who reject salvation. Now, that is a warning worth giving. It's just not the one given here. This warning is not about rejecting but neglecting salvation. And the word neglect, do you see that word in verse 3? How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It, It literally means to disregard to give no weight. 
Again, it's another play on words. To pay no attention to. The word translated neglect here in this text appears also in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22. There the Lord is giving the parable of a wedding feast. A great master has prepared a feast and sent his servants out to invite all of his subjects to come to the wedding feast. And notice what the text says, but they paid no attention. That's the word neglect. They neglected the master's invitation. They gave it no weight. They paid it no mind. They paid it no attention and went their separate ways, one to his farm and another to his business. It occurs to me that it wasn't that they didn't want to go to the wedding feast. It's that they just wanted to go somewhere else more. They had higher priorities and other passions. With that in mind, I want to give you a word of prophecy this morning. I'm going to read your mail. I'm going to tell you exactly how close you are to the Lord. And I can tell it just by looking at you. Brother Andrew, I'm about to tell you in front of all these people exactly how close you are to Jesus. Brother Lynn, I'm going to tell you exactly how close you are to Jesus. Miss Dawn, I'm going to tell you exactly how close you are to Jesus. And I know the names of most of the people in this room. If I could just see you with these lights on, I could go around the room and tell you exactly how close you are to Jesus. You're as close as you want to be. And you're not one hair further away from Him than that. What is your spiritual passion. I spent some time on a tractor yesterday doing some work. Went to bed thinking about some more work I need to do on that tractor. Dreamed all night long about riding a tractor. You've had stuff like that happen before, stuff on your mind and you go to bed and you dream about it all night. Wednesday night when I went to bed up in Kentucky, I had an early Thursday morning flight. I spent all night in my dreams, restless, missing flights, leaving my luggage in the rental car. I mean, it was just just awful. When was the last time you went to bed so concerned that all night long in your dreams you witnessed to a co-worker? When was the last time you wrestled in your sleep all night long trying to figure out when you were going to have that daily quiet time? When was the last time you were awakened all night by troubling dreams that you couldn't find your Bible and you're looking everywhere for it, but it's nowhere to be found? I'm talking about a spiritual passion, a commitment to simple purity. Thirdly and finally, a commitment to scriptural progress. There's an interesting description here of the Word of God that we find from the middle of verse 3 and continuing. After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. Which, by the way, that's one of the best arguments against apostolic authorship of the book of Hebrews. That's a little study footnote. But the writer here is apparently at least a second generation believer. Did not hear it directly from the Lord, but from somebody who heard it from the Lord. Verse 4, God also testifying with them by signs and wonders, by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. In this context, I believe the writer simply wants us to know that the Word of God that we hold in our hand is a reliable and trustworthy Word from a reliable and trustworthy God. And if you want to avoid drifting away from the Lord, there's your lifeline right there. That's your rope, that's your anchor, that's your only hope. Sometime back, I was in the parking lot here, and a man came by, pulled in. I don't know if he didn't have a phone or a map or whatever, but he asked me the best way to get to Brunswick. I said, if you just keep going right down this road, I'm talking about 121 South, you go, you go all the way down through town, you go all the way to a red light in the city of Hoboken, and if you turn to the left, you'll be in Brunswick. That's, that's where that road leads. 
Let me tell you where a road leads that disregards the Word of God. It leads to a life of drifting and waywardness. But a life that ties itself to the Word of God and the God of that Word is a life that stays close and clean with the Lord. The best definition of backsliding that I've ever heard in my life is just this little question. Has there ever been a time in your life you've been closer to the Lord than you are right now? If so, the good news of grace is your Father will welcome you home today. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emanuel Pulpit.